Welcome to Mindful Empowerment. I'm your host, Dr. Mary Elizabeth, and today we're very excited to have with us Sophia Smallstorm. She is an independent researcher. She has gone to two Ivy League schools and is highly respected. Thank you so much for being here, Sophia. Oh, you're welcome. In fact, I just want to say the second school I went to was a um, it was a special postgraduate pre-med program because I was going to go to medical school. And then I decided, no, this is not for me. And thank God I decided that. Yeah, that's interesting. So you had the opportunity to go to medical school and... No, to just- prepare for it. But it was already so competitive that I hated it. I hated the whole attitude of it. And then you decided to go ahead and take a different route. Is that right? Yeah, I became kind of a writer in the health field, sports and health. I was in the running, uh, running marathon scene. And I started getting into fitness, writing about fitness. And then that basically kind of served as a transition, a bridge into what I do now, which is more than fitness. I mean, it's like whole body health and the delving into the way that, you know, the body works, learning a little bit about biochemistry, a little bit about bioelectricity, a little bit about anatomy and um, what the different organs do. And I mean, these are things that, when you go to medical school, you'll learn a lot of it. You won't learn bioelectricity and you really won't learn biochemistry, but you get prepped for the workings of the body. And then, of course, you're trained to uh, recommend um, pharmaceutical drugs, right? Because mm-hmm. that's, that's the relationship. And what was it you, you said you decided you didn't want to take that path to go to medical school? What was it that, that made you make that decision? It was really the attitude of the other students. I was in a a special program at Columbia University so that I could quickly gather together my um, science requirements for med school because I had gone to Brown University and I was just a liberal arts student. I was was, uh, a writing, uh, you know, I guess a a write creative writing major, which was part of the semiotics department, which is a very unusual word that most people haven't heard. But Brown was the only... Uh, university with an undergraduate program in semiotics and that's the study of signs and symbols in communication it delves into linguistics but it also envelops uh, film film theory literature writing drama theater so I was like a creative arts type of person but then I thought oh my god what am I ever going to do with this I better become a doctor So at that time, some of my very good friends were in med school, and I decided, okay, this is what I should have done. And so I went to Columbia to this special program to pull my science requirements together, and just the attitude of the other students, terrible. And then you had to do organic chemistry over the summer in a lab. And I thought, no way. I'm going to be inside in some ugly, stuffy, room all summer while the birds are flying outside and the butterflies and the sun is shining and the you know beach water is lapping on the beaches and I'm stuck here I'm not doing it so my body said don't do this I will not like you if you do this it wasn't even that much of an intellectual decision it was like you would call it a visceral decision yeah almost like a a gut instinct then yes 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 And I was right, because I did not want to be cooped up. I mean, I've interviewed doctors like Jennifer Daniels, and she she actually pulled off an MD and um, master's, uh, what is it called, in economics from, um, from University of Pennsylvania, I think it was. And she did both at once, both at once. She got an economics degree and... uh, an MD at the same time. And she hardly ate. She told me she ate like once a week or every other day she had little snacks. I, that was not me. Yeah, I hear you on that. And it's interesting you mentioned the, atti- the attitude of the students. What, what was that? Well, these were other students uh, directed toward med school as I was. And, you know, when we had lab and the instructions were weird, I... Others would come to me and say, hey, how do you do this? How do you do that? What are you doing? Do you know what he means? Meaning the professor. And 
I would explain to the best of my ability. But when I went to people to ask them a question, they didn't have time to help me. And I realized, you know what? People are not going to do what I do for them. And so why should I be in this milieu? And these are the people who are going to, to be, you, you would think, wanting to help people above all, taking the you know, oath of doctors and such like that. Right. But that would be their patients. But, you know, and then I, I, was, I familiarized myself with one hospital setting because I had friends who worked in a hospital and they were in the ER and I went to a couple of ER parties and things like this. And there was cooperation there. And I think when you're on a medical treat trauma team like triage, you are cooperating. But that's in an ER situation. There is a lot of hierarchy between nurses, doctors, orderlies, staff. The whole medical community is another world altogether. And I was able to explore this in the legal world as well, because I, I worked at a bunch of law firms at one point in my career. And then I just became an independent researcher, um, because the internet allowed me to do that. Right, that's true. And now, what what are your uh, most recent interests in area of research? Well, I have learned the term oxidative stress. Oxidative stress is the loss of bioelectricity, electrons, to the cell and not enough gain. So the way that we operate on a minute-by-minute basis is our cells pick up electrons from a nanomolecule called a nanobattery, you could call it even, adenosine triphosphate. And the mitochondria in our cells, which are these independent organelles that are derived from ancient bacteria, they're not human. All of your cells have mitochondria in them except mature red blood cells. They don't have a nucleus and they don't have mitochondria, but immature red blood cells do. But anyway, um, the mitochondrial function is... Traditionally, it's seen as creating, refurnishing complete ATP with new electrons. Because ATP is a molecule that's so precious to the body, like cholesterol, it's recycled. So your cells draw out of ATP every millisecond electrons. And then the ATP is reduced to adenosine diphosphate and adenosine monophosphate. And more electrons have to be packed into it to recycle it into full-blown ATP. Now, what's interesting is you turn over, meaning you recycle, meaning you refurnish and remake for, your, for yourself your body weight in ATP every day. So if you're 100 pounds, you're making and using 100 pounds of ATP every day. And if you run out of ATP, you don't live. You won't live but a few minutes. So this is the energy of the cell. And ATP, if there isn't enough being produced, the cell starts to, let's just say, lose energy. It starts to decline. And it has three choices. It has three ways to go if it starts losing electrons. It can become weakened and kind of falter, limp along, and that will be a diseased state. It can die immediately, boom, necrosis, instant cell death. Or it can start defending itself in a way that's very, you would say, peculiar in that it throws a protein shield around its outside. It's trying to defend from invaders. It stops. It's not able to make um, energy in the nucleus anymore because the mitochondria are failing. So it reverts to what's called glycolysis, and it starts to produce energy from the cytoplasm using enzymes upon sugar, right? Um, And that it can do for a while. That's kind of a default that we have. We're mainly oxygen consuming from the nucleus. It's called aerobic respiration or the Krebs cycle. The cells make their energy, uh, take ATP electrons, or they can start making energy. This is anaerobic energy production in the cytoplasm. And the cytoplasm in a healthy cell has to be negatively charged. This is where the bioelectricity comes in. And some very progressive researchers have maintained that the job of the mitochondria is not just to make ATP, it's really to keep the charge in the um, cytoplasm negative. Negative charge means the presence of electrons, right? 
positive charge means an absence of electrons and a, and a surplus of protons. So your cells need to have electrons furnishing them all the time for energy. And when they don't have enough electrons, they start to falter. So you become a diseased individual. And th that faltering shows up in a particular organ, a particular type of tissue, a particular cell group. And wherever that weakness, that loss of electrons shows up, this is called oxidative stress, that's given a disease name. So really, if you really want to boil it down, it's, there's only one disease, and that is oxidative stress. But wherever it shows up, in whatever batch of tissues or whatever organ, it's given a name. That's the disease name. That's so interesting. I, I usually you know, I read that inflammation is the cause of the disease, and then wherever the inflammation ends up, then that's the name of what the disease that we call it. Um, so really, what you're, you're doing is even getting to beyond that and what causes that, that inflammation, right? Right. Now, inflammation is a byproduct of cell damage, okay? And let's just say you came from Mars and you were wandering around the streets and you saw a couple of auto accidents. You weren't there to witness them, but you saw them. And in the vicinity of the auto accident was broken glass. And you, you concluded wrongly that wherever there's broken glass, there's auto accident. So the broken glass must cause the auto accident, right? Mm -hmm. But the fact is that the broken glass is a result of the auto accident. And you won't know that until you are there to witness an auto accident. So what happens in the body is there's something called the inflammatory response. And it's very classic. It doesn't mean there's an infection. It doesn't mean disease will be caused because of this. It's simply a series of stages that follow one another that occur when the body is trying to heal injured cells, cells that have oxidative stress. So inflammation, whether you twist your ankle or something happens to you inside, some organ gets injured or starts to become weak and falter, you're going to have the inflammatory response. It's always the same thing. It's the same sequence of cellular activity. And so your source of Injury can be trauma, it can be stress, overuse of an area, fatigue, uh, drastic temperature changes in the environment, exposure to toxins, nutritional deficiencies. All of those things will result in damage or breakdown of cells. And then the, then the link to the mitochondria is the... I know you brought up several things in the beginning, um, but the the mitochondria are involved in having the cells having enough electrons and making sure we have enough ATP so that the, the cell doesn't decline. And could you explain a little bit more about um, maybe that and then the, how that is related to the inflammation? I mean, if, I, if I have that. Right. So that. wherever there's cell damage or injury, there's going to be inflammation, Right. There has to be, because inflammation, just consider it the beginning of repair. The body has to try to repair what's broken. So the energy requirements of the injured cells are going to be significant. They need an energy supply. They need electrons. They also need nutrients. They need special attention, good food, right? right. So the inflammatory response starts with a lot of blood flow to the, to the area. So the tissues around the injured area open up. The, this is called swelling. We call it swelling. And we think swelling is bad. Oh, your foot is so swollen. It's, you've got to bring down the swelling. Well, listen, the swelling is because the body has puffed up an area like a balloon because it wants all the vessels open, wide open. It wants the blood vessels open, the lymphatic vessels open so that it can ship repair materials there and get waste out more expediently. 
right? So that is the point of swelling. And then we have, after the swelling, we have these shipments of repair materials, of things like um, histamine. We have enzymes. We have a digestive process that goes on within the cell. The cells produce endosomes, enzymes that are called lysosomes. And this is like the beginning of the cell trying to work on organic debris that's resulted from the injury. So these stages follow one another. You have, um, you've got the swelling that isolates or fences off and blows up the injured area. Then you have chemotaxis is a process that attracts red, uh, white blood cells to the area. And you get heat and fever and you get all of these different symptoms of what we consider bad. Traditionally, we've been told swelling is bad, fever is bad, you've got to bring it down. But the fact is, when you have a fever, your, for instance, muscles around bones start, they heat up to borrow calcium from the bones because the calcium activates white blood cells. So there's a lot of reason, rhyme and reason, to why the body has these typical symptoms when it's injured. And our traditional education is to, to stop all of that. You know, if you have a swollen foot, elevate it, wrap it in an ACE bandage, put ice on it. So why are you constricting tissues that the body has tried to inflate? So you have lots of different cells that do different jobs. I call this whole process chemotaxis because there, it might be an error to call it that, but it's just easier for me. So you've got lots of different blood cells and lots of different enzymes and lots of different activities. Some cells turn on histamine, other cells stop it. And this all follows one stage after another. You have um, eosinophils that come in and um, eat cellular debris. Then you have neutrophils. You have all these different cell types. I call these battalions. And this is basically like the body is using its army of cells, its battalions, to tackle the job of repair. And what's interesting is some of the cells will actually eat up the cells that preceded them. So it's very orderly. Um, you have macrophages that eat up the dead neutrophils and eosinophils. So there are cleaners that clean up, then there are cleaners that clean up the cleaners. And in the end, you should have healing. But if you don't, if the rate of cell death still exceeds the rate of cell repair, your body will call in the Navy. Now the Navy is the bloodstream that would be the ocean, the analogy to the ocean. And all the little ships sailing on the ocean would be the bacteria and microbes in your body that are deployed to eat up more organic debris. That's what bacteria do. They clean, they're the trash men of the body. So now you've got bacteria that actually, in the um, terminology of, of Béchamp, pleomorphism, the bacteria will morph into a different type of bacteria based on the type of food they're consuming. So this is when bacteria start out in a certain form and then because of where they're sent and what they eat, what they're cleaning up, they may change shape. They actually become a different looking shape. So they can go from rod shape to cone shape to spiral just based on their diet. And medical researchers will look at a blood specimen under a microscope and they'll see squiggly things and they'll think this caused the disease, just the way we thought broken glass caused the car accident. But the fact is this squiggly thing took on this squiggly shape because of what it was eating. Now, that is the Navy. So the, the Body calls in the army first, its own battalions of cells. Then it'll call in the navy if the army can't deal with the problem. And those would be the trash men. You're housing already 
trillions and trillions, maybe a quadrillion different little microorganisms that are crawling all over your organs. They're in your gut. They constitute what's known as the gut biome, the microbiome. They live in your armpits. They live on your skin. They're everywhere. So they might as well be deployed into action. And that becomes a second stage of injury repair. And when we get a bacterial infection, which is called sepsis, a blood-borne bacterial infection, it's simply because the bacteria have over-multiplied. They've had too much food to eat, and they multiply very rapidly. And they actually keep their own numbers in check because they produce very toxic wastes with uh, high chemical content. And as we know, chemicals kill bacteria. That's why you know, we put bleach on things to clean them. So chemicals are very harsh. Bacteria can't tolerate harsh, harsh chemistry. And um, in some cases, our blood will carry off the very uh, toxic waste material that the bacteria are producing to keep themselves in check. But once the blood scarfs it up and runs off with these waste materials, they can start toxifying other organs. So now we are in this critical situation called sepsis. And now we need uh, antibacterials or antibiotics. So that's why the hospitals give you IV antibiotics. It's to keep those bacterial populations in check because they have over-multiplied. So then if we get to that level, that means in their earlier stages that something wasn't functioning right in the, in the, in the first place. Some, and then we had to go, you know, with your analogy, the army had to go to the Navy and then, then we're in sepsis. So it's in the beginning, in the beginning, if the cell's functioning as it, as it should, the whole process, then that, that will result um, in healing. And what would be, what would be some reasons why then the bot, the body isn't able to achieve healing in the earlier stages well, let's just say you're, not, you're eating a terrible diet. Let's say you eat just processed food. You don't get a lot of minerals. You don't get nutrients. You don't get vitamins. You're eating, you know, standard American diet. You don't eat veggies. You don't eat fruit. You don't go out in the sun. You sit at your computer all the time. So the way we live now doesn't support healing. It really doesn't. That's why we are t- developing so much degenerative disease, because we're basically falling apart. All systems are degenerating. So in the hospital, when they give you the IV antibiotics to keep that bacterial overgrowth in check, that'll give your body a chance to catch up with its own inflammatory healing mechanisms. But what does the hospital give you for for quality uh, nutrient input? It gives you saline drip and glucose, salt and sugar. What's that going to do for you? They don't give you the proper support, the proper nutritional support that you need. You're not out in the sun. You're not getting electrons by having your feet on the ground. You're just getting salt, sugar, and antibiotics. So that's not going to help you much. It'll help you a bit. And hopefully you will get enough of a leg up that you won't die of septic shock or sepsis. But 50% of hospital deaths are actually caused by septic shock. Um, conditions, your blood-borne sepsis, because the hospital doesn't know have the first faintest idea how to give you true support when you are in there. So if, now here's the third stage, if the army can't do the job, Navy doesn't help that much, our body calls in the Air Force. The Air Force is what I call viruses, exosomes. So the Air Force is called by the sick cells, the cells that are ailing, through, this is just my theory, unproven, through the gap junctions, which are the fiber optic clusters that enable communication through infrared, infrared light. The body communicates, cells are cooperative, they talk to each other. A sick cell will go, hey, things are bad for me. I tried making endosomes, that was my first thing that I was doing. I tried chemotaxis, I called in the Navy with the bacteria and I'm still not getting better. And this won't be just one cell, it'll be cells in a certain area. So they call out to other healthy cells of the body and they say, send me help, I need the Air Force. So. The other cells that are healthy will make what's called exosomes. 
And these are crystalline materials, proteins that have crystalline componentry, and they are shipped out on the bloodstream. That's what conventionally we call viruses. Now, once again, they don't cause the disease. They are latecomers. And they function, in my analogy, just the way the fuel tankers function in the Air Force. They fly and they meet a C-130 in the air, a helicopter, and they donate fuel. There is a fuel line that the two planes need to connect with. And then the plane that's in distress gets refueled. So in my analogy, the exosome viruses are piezoelectric. They are crystalline. If you look at pictures of coronavirus, they're all pointy. So this pointy, these pointy um, spikes, when they make contact with a sick cell, they will generate a voltage and they will open up that, those voltage gates on the cell membrane. And they will go into the cell. Now, in, in conventional virology, we, we read that viruses infect a cell and then they multiply in the cell. Well, maybe the exosomic virus things do that. They go into a cell and they bing, bing, bing. They put out a bunch of electrons and the ailing cell says, wow, that's just what I needed, electrons, thank you. And then they have a way of self-replicating. And there are more of them. So now the sick cell gets more electrons. Now it's happy. It's getting better. So I believe viruses are healing agents and they're bioelectric in nature. Yeah, that is, is very interesting. It is um, uh, like a, a vesicle with a piece of the DNA or RNA and then, and then it merges with the cell and can then insert that into the cell. So, you know, that makes that makes a lot of sense what you're saying and yesterday i was looking into more of something that i was researching and it's finally dawned on me that in the conventional literature it says viruses which we're supposed to believe are bad attached to the surface of red blood cells well why and this is called infectivity this is called hemagglutination right? They bind red blood cells, they attach to red blood cells, they agglutinate and bind the red blood cells together. Um, But attaching to the blood cells is known as infectivity. And I'm thinking the red blood cells from the work of Stephanie Seneff, I know to be coated with negative charge. This also comes from the biophysicists that I've uh, looked into. They say that your red blood cells must have negative charge on them. Seneff says that that negative charge is conferred by a coating of cholesterol sulfate, or let's just say the the presence of cholesterol sulfate in your body. It's a cosmotrope. It confers negative charge to the red blood cells, which helps the blood cells to transport hemoglobin and oxygen. Well, they contain the hemoglobin and to transport oxygen. So I think that viruses attach to the surface of red blood cells because they're meant to be carried in the bloodstream to cells that need them. So really, the in you know in the way you're looking at it, the what people are calling viruses could really be exosomes. They are exosomes. Exo simply means outside. Your cell makes endosomes. That's the first thing it does when it gets damaged. It makes endosomes and enzymes called lysosomes that start to digest organic debris. Then at the end, if it doesn't have the ability to heal, it'll call for exosomes. It'll call to other cells. Exo means from outside. It will tell the other cells to make some things, send it to me. That's an exosome. Just means it comes from outside. I see. And then would these would these um, viruses or or the, the exosomes be contagious from person to person? Who knows? Probably not. I have a whole different theory of contagion than most people do. I think that we have a lot of copycat stuff going on. And a lot of our disease that we believe to be because of contagious uh, materials that we catch from other people really has to do with effluence. If you're coughing and sneezing and hacking, by the way, all that coughing, sneezing and hacking, the different colored materials coming out of your respiratory tract and throat 
indicate different types of cells that are being replaced. So conventionally, you know, we have flu season. There's no disease called flu. Flu just means you're under the weather and you're repairing, you're doing a lot of internal repair. And every time, you know, you, you will see all these, um, these uh, warnings on drug inserts and packages. You might give you flu-like symptoms. Well, listen, flu simply means something's going on inside the body. It's doing a wholesale inflammatory response to cells that are damaged. And when, you, when the weather turns in the fall, there's less sunlight, it's colder, our body makes its mind up to replenish certain cell and tissue layers. And it does that. So it has to run a fever. It has to kick and slough off a bunch of cells in your respiratory tract because that's where the cold air is coming in. And that's, you know, that's a very important meeting place between you and the environment, your lungs, your skin is another one, your throat, mouth. Anyway, so the body will get rid of a bunch of cells from inside, um, you know, mucosal passages and lung linings, and it will replace all those cells. And in order for it to do that work, it has to make you feel very tired and very bad. So you have to lie down. That's another reason we have pain when we sprain our ankle and stiffening and rigidity. The body is saying, I'm going to make this hurt. Don't move it. So we shouldn't be taking painkillers, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. We should be lying down, giving that ankle arrest. When we have flu, we should be lying down, giving ourselves a rest. We should not be taking cough suppressants and things that stop your runny nose. We should be running our nose like mad, coughing like mad, and getting rid of all those cells and tissues, throwing them out so they can be repaired. And this is why after the flu, you feel fantastic. And you might go and be around other people who have the flu, who are sick, and you get nothing. And it's because you already did all the work. Now, if you don't do the work completely, if you don't replenish your tissue layers properly because you've been taking all these medic over-the-counter medications, cough syrup and whatnot, guess what? In three weeks, you'll have to do it again. You'll get sick. Mm. And I'd, I'd be interested to know more about your theory on contagion. Oh, so let's say... You, are, you encounter somebody who is throwing off terrible stuff. Their body's going through some huge reconstruction process inside. It doesn't even matter what disease they have, what it's called. And some of, they're hacking and they're spewing materials outside of them, around them. And some of that stuff lands on you. Your body encounters it and it goes, my God, what is this stuff? I'm going to have to mount some kind of inflammatory response, protective measures immediately because I haven't seen a gunk like this before. So you immediately start piling on a response mechanism because your body has understood that there's something very noxious around it and it needs to protect itself. That's as far as I've gotten. When you go into you know, a room full of sick people and you get sick, your body may have taken on some of this stuff that's effluence is what I call it. And it may have said, you know what, it's a good time for me to do the same rebuilding. I'm going to do this too. Seasonally in groups, we behave similarly because the conditions around us are similar, right? Mm -hmm. So I think contagion could be because you have to mount a defense against some stuff that someone has spewed out of them. It's not the bacteria that's coming with the stuff necessarily. It could be, but it's not that that disease is contagious. It's because that person around you was involved in something very uh, dramatic in his or her body, and your body decided, I have to protect against this. I have to do something similar. Mm -hmm. It might not be a good theory, but it's where I am at this time, and I'm wondering about it. I'm learning all the time. Yeah, that that makes sense. And then when, and then the the vi the so the viruses are the the exosomes in someone's body are. are 
you know, as, as you spoke of, they're there to help to actually help the body to heal, to help to rebuild and, and repair. Is that right? Right. And I also think that our biome, our microbiome, we have kind of a shared microbiome. Like the Indians, I was reading about the Comanches recently, and the Indians really couldn't handle cholera or smallpox. They really went under because of those diseases, which were considered white men's diseases. Now, it could be that the microbiome of the Plains Indians just had never met up with the materials or couldn't manufacture the materials necessary to deal with these diseases because they ate a very, very specific kind of a diet and they got their nutrients secondarily. So when you, they were meat eaters, that's all they did. They fed on buffalo. When they killed a buffalo, they would rip it open and the children would beg to eat the heart. They would eat the meat raw or dripping with blood. They would drink the blood. They would cut open the stomach of a buffalo calf that they had killed, and they would immediately descend on the curdled milk in the stomach and drink it mixed with blood. So why are they doing these gross things? They're doing them because living on the prairie, which supported, you know, very husky grasses and thistles, and really only herbivores could feed on the things that grew on the prairie. Yeah, you had a few wild cherries and berries and nuts, but you really didn't have enough of that to live on. So the Indians would slaughter a buffalo and basically drink its blood because the blood carried all those important nutrients that came from the grasses that the humans couldn't eat. So carnivores live secondarily on nutrients that come from vegetables, from vegetation, let's just call it. And where you can eat vegetation directly, you're better supported it could be, this is just theoretical, in terms of disease deflection and internal healing than you are when you're a secondary consumer, like a carnivore is. And then, so they had, um, they didn't have as good as a result when they came across those other diseases then based on their... Right. I mean, they were basically Stone Age people living in the 1800s, the 17 and 1800s. They were the best horsemen ever known on this planet. Because, but the way that the Plains Indians encountered the horse was because the Pueblo Indians in New Mexico in the 1600s were sick of being under Spanish rule and being bossed around by the Spaniards, so they threw them out. And they tended the horses, but they didn't know how to ride them And they just simply let all the Spanish horses go. And these became the Mustang herds of North America. And the Plains Indians found them. Comanches were bow-legged. That was their body type. Very short, barrel-chested, bow-legged. And I guess maybe they fit really well on horses. They They were very dexterous on horseback. They could do amazing tricks. And they mastered horse training and even horse breeding like nobody else. But they... um, succumbed to these modern diseases because they were stone age people they had nothing metal they had only stuff made from bones and stone and wood and um, they heated water by uh, putting it in pouches uh, dried hide and uh, dropping rocks into it hot rocks from the fire Uh, But when they found the white man's metal and ribbons and buttons and tin pans and kettles and all this stuff, they wanted it. And they got the diseases as well. And maybe their biome couldn't handle those diseases. Maybe they didn't have the the right bacteria or or they weren't able to make the right exosomes. Exactly. That would be it. And so they succumbed. There were bed bug filled blankets I've read, and maybe the bed bugs had something, a toxin that the Indians didn't know what to do with in their body type. Hmm. And looking at um, today with the, the coronavirus, do you, um, I don't know if you want to get into to that at all, or what would be really causing that or anything you'd want to say on that? Well, I honestly 
wonder if there's really a coronavirus. I mean, I know there's the coronavirus because if you look it up on Wikipedia, it shows you a picture of it and it looks just like the thing that Dr. Andrew Kaufman calls an exosome. And Wikipedia will tell you that it causes the common cold. Well, I believe it's the result. It's the Air Force um, response when you have flu or cold. So everybody has manufactured coronavirus and everybody might at any time have coronaviruses in their bloodstream, but it's not causing a disease called COVID-19. And so whatever's causing COVID-19 could be any number of things, and it could be not COVID-19. I mean, there are people, the way that the hospitals are cooking the books and manipulating the intake records of patients, everybody who's taken into a hospital is recorded as a COVID patient, maybe because they're tested and they have those particular materials in their bodies, or maybe because Medicare pays $13,000 every time you write down that somebody came in with COVID. And then when you put them on a ventilator, boom, Medicare gives you $39,000 for that. So there are many reasons that we're seeing COVID sprawling all over the world, but it's not necessarily a disease called COVID, right? Right, right. It, yeah, so like you, like you said, it could be any number of things resulted in those pretty common symptoms. Um, and we, so it could be having to do with um, mitochondria not functioning properly, right? Yeah, they all they brought this about when old people were falling ill with late season flus and colds. This is when they decided to introduce COVID to the Western world. And that was late February, February, March. And that everybody in every culture Western culture, certainly, there's going to be colds and at, in February, March. Now, if you go to the, what's called the Southern Hemisphere, it's the opposite there in terms of weather. But there are late season colds and flus. And this is when we saw the emergence of COVID-19, this novel coronavirus. But the fact is that most of the people who died from it were in their 80s and 90s, and they might have been just regular old, quote unquote, flu deaths. But everything was written down as a COVID death. And somebody wrote on, on a YouTube comment, and I believe that, I mean, I have no reason not to believe this because it matches so many stories we're hearing, that his father or his father-in-law uh, died recently because he crossed the street and was hit by a car and he was put down as a COVID death. Yeah, I've been, I've been hearing things like that as well, definitely. And all the positive, I mean, immunoglobin G is an antibody test for COVID, but immunoglobin G, if you look it up, as I did, it's the most common antibody we produce. So it could be produced for any number of reasons, and it could be in us. And so they say to us, you want an, an immunoglobin G IgG test for COVID? And people will say, sure, sure. And then they're positive. What does that mean? The HIV test that they came up with was a nonspecific antibody test. Any number of things, 100 different conditions could give you a positive HIV result. So people are taking the test and then they're testing positive for whatever it is they're looking at. But how do, I guess, yes, how do we know that that is what this, the specific disease is? Like we take the COVID-19 test, it says you tested positive for this, which might mean that you, just, you have one of the exosomes that's going to trigger a positive test. Right. Or... You know, in Africa, you don't have to get an HIV test to be HIV positive. Can you imagine that? How do they determine then if somebody's HIV positive in Africa? Well, they have these clinics, these NGO clinics, and the Africans who are illiterate, very, you know, undereducated show up and they're told, you know, there's this terrible disease going around Africa. It's called AIDS. And you have to come into this clinic and we'll tell you if you're positive for this disease or not, if you'll catch this disease or not, develop this disease. So the conditions in Africa upon which you can be deemed HIV positive, any of these conditions, I'll try to remember them all. Um, dehydration, weight loss, fever, nausea, uh, nausea and vomiting, and uh, I think malnutrition or something like that. Well, guess what? Many, many, many people in Africa have those conditions. And that's all you need. And once you come into a 
an, a clinic and they say, oh, you have weight loss, dehydration, nausea, you have HIV. Now, this is terrible. You could develop this terrible disease, the wasting disease, AIDS. Do you want to develop this disease? And people will say, no, of course not. Well, good. Don't worry. We have doctors, nurses. We have medicines. And this is where they give the Africans, the unsuspecting Africans, there was a disease, uh, sorry, a drug, nevirapine. And they gave nevirapine to these Africans who showed up and were told they were HIV positive. And they all took this nevirapine. It was told to them to be a medicine against AIDS. And it, then in, the, in JAMA, a New England Journal of Medicine, on the other side of the world, they published the result that nevirapine reduces the transmission of HIV from mother to child by 50%. Well, guess what? It killed the mother and the child. So, of course, they can say that. So, the results that we read about in our medical journals, uh, drawn from studies, quote-unquote studies that are done in Africa, the pretexts are very, very flimsy. Yeah, yeah. And I know we we'll have a small amount of time left. In in the beginning, we were talking about the um, the mitochondria, and so really looking at at all disease, it's because of the mitochondria. Somehow, failing, the function is failing. failing. Is that right? Right. And they're not producing. They're not reconstituting ATP fast enough for the cell to survive. Mitochondrial failure is the cause of all disease. Oxidative stress is the cause of all disease. And mitochondrial failure causes too much oxidation, energy loss in the cell. So that's the relationship of those two terms. And then to, to get to what was ca causing all the mitochondria to fail. I, I know we talked about the unhealthy diet and, you know, people are maybe stressed out and what might be other things that would be behind that? Well, any condition that stresses the cells and those could be psychological conditions because psychological conditions put you in too much um, autonomic nervous system imbalance. So if you're stressed out, if you're anxious and afraid all the time, you will be in not in parasympathetic mode, which, is, which enables you to rest, digest, sleep, and do deep cellular repairs. You will be in sympathetic nervous system mode, which is the production of adrenaline and um, you know, fear hormones, and it really taxes you. It changes the balance of everything you're doing, from electrical to um, repair to uh, your body's organization. You breathe very shallowly when you're in sympathetic mode. So you really don't even get enough oxygen. So stress can cause, psychological stress can cause disease. It can cause a breakdown somewhere in your body. Exposure to toxins, nutritional deficiencies, trauma, blunt trauma, you know, banging, bumping, falling, hurting. So then the biochemistry of inflammation and repair starts, of which this exosomic production by other cells, the shipping of, of bioelectrical crystalline materials to the ailing cells, that's just part of the biochemistry of inflammation and repair. Yes. Yeah, thank you so much for all that you've sh shared. Um, I know I... I did want to talk about the vaccines and um, and other things as well. So hopefully we can connect again. But uh, thank you so much, Sophia. And was, is there anything else um, particular um, today you wanted to close with? Well, sure. I'd like to mention my blog, sophiasmallstorm.com. I post things there pretty much on a daily basis that you might find interesting. It's part of a larger website that's static called About the Sky, but the blog page is active. And also, I'd like to mention my online store, Avatar, A-V-A-T-A-R, like the movie, avatarproducts.com. And I really would say that I've brought a more bioremediation flavor to this site. So I sell products on it that I have stumbled into and in some cases have, uh, to some extent, developed with biochemists. Um, 
iodine, different magnesium products that really support repair in your body because magnesium enlarges vessels and allows that, that repair process to happen more easily. Um, and these are daily, you know, day u- daily use products. You can take iodine a couple of drops every day. It'll really help you because these are things that I feel have helped me. They've helped me to regulate my body better. And lots and lots of people have been selling these products for years. So you could take a look there, your listeners. And thank you. Great. Yeah, actually that I've been meaning to do to start iodine myself. So I'm going to, I'm going to look into that. I've been reading about the benefits of that. Uh, awesome. Hope, thank you so much, Sophia Smallstorm. It's great to talking with you and thank you to our listeners. Uh, please go ahead and check out um, the site she mentioned in her store. I'll go ahead and post those links down below and hopefully we'll um, continue th- um, this conversation another time, Sophia. Thanks. Yeah, it would be great. Thank you, Mary. Thank you very much. Thank you.